Let's talk about surveillance. This is a term that is ubiquitously thrown around in various contexts. And it's often framed in a really negative or like Big Brother-esque kind of way. It makes you think about things like covert operations, data mining, secret decision making. However, if you actually think about it, those are similar terms that you could apply towards the positive version, which is social intelligence. Teamwork and ambition, in a lot of ways you can think about that as the same as like covert observation, data mining, secret decision making. The only difference is it's all contained up here in the human brain, so we call it social intelligence. But there's a lot of similarities in the positives that come along with those terms to the negatives that come along with big governments or corporations having massive servers that do the same thing. And I just was sitting there thinking to myself, like, why are they so similar? What is it, if you had to define it, that makes it so negative when it becomes this like Orwellian, like, you know, control everything and like make decisions for you and people lose their own freedoms? And why is it such a good thing when it's like an individual that's ambitious, that understands social dynamics? And I think it's that we evolved with it. We have both the ability to be that kind of a person, but also to understand it. But even deeper than that, when it's inside of the human brain, what you would consider surveillance is limited in the sense that you have emotions. Like you're built a certain way from your DNA. It should feel bad for most of us it does when you betray someone, when you lie to them, when you do something wrong for your gain. In a way, it's nice to know that people are supposed to naturally be helpful or that you get icky feelings when you take advantage of somebody. But when it goes up to the cloud and surveillance is just an algorithm that's completely indifferent and its goal is to make money or do advertising or whatever, we just can't really trust it or understand it in the same way. So in this video, I really just wanted to explore the dichotomy between what it is up here that is very similar to what we call surveillance when it's up there. Because when it's at scale and it's up there, we can end up with something closer to a nightmare scenario, something Orwellian. Imagine like a king who wants to know everything about all of its citizens. It doesn't matter, governments, religious organizations, mega corporations, they're all possibly able to do that in the future because they can harvest and utilize so much data on all of us with superhuman level, level intelligence soon. We'd better hope that they're not doing them for nefarious purposes and even just general capitalism making money might lead us into a bad place. But the weirdest thing is, the more I think about it or try to demonize it, it's actually kind of hard to do because it's so similar to what we actually do and the choices we make. Functional aspects of our memory are essentially localized surveillance. It's just neural systems and that's mandated. That's part of evolution. That's part of survival of the fittest. Observation and adaptation are the underlying concepts of surveillance. Just being honest, it's an inherent aspect of evolution, particularly for socially oriented human beings like us. Let's go from localized to global. Let's traverse the Life. spectrum of surveillance. The Pandora's box really opens up when you get to the kind of memory observation and decision making that would be probably more like 10 or 15 people or bigger. When you know your social group, it's just smart beyond what a human could know. That's when decision making start to average and certain patterns start to emerge that people can make money on, advertisers can take advantage of. That part is where we need to kind of focus on. So I'll tell you what actually got me thinking about it. This woman, her name is Meredith Whitaker. She is the president of a big company called Signal. And she said in this interview, she basically deemed artificial intelligence to be fundamentally a surveillance technology and it requires the surveillance business model. It's an exacerbation of what we've seen since the late 90s and the development of surveillance advertising. So it's not, you know, the, the, kind of the Venn diagram as a circle, as I've said. And to her credit, I think a lot of the conversation was taken out of context of what she meant. She was mostly referring to advertising and how it follows you around the internet. It kind of exploits you, it learns who you are. So surveillance, and then it made me think about what it actually means for these AI systems to surveil us why AI is so similar to the human brain, and if I could kind of link that all the way back to the human brain. Like, is the human brain a surveillance system, and are we getting ourselves into trouble by trying to build AI? that's human-like? And my conclusion is I think so. So I wanna talk through all of the different ways that I've sort of made the comparison and why maybe we want to build an AI that's not quite like us. First off, a neural network and a human brain have a lot of similarities. What you're doing is you're approximating a function. That's one way to think about it. The other is that you're just learning patterns and you have these sort of layers that can be tuned 
finer and finer, but they can also be overtuned, so they need to generalize. All that kind of stuff applies both to the human brain and to a general neural network, whether that's connected to vision or text or LLMs, whatever it is. So it's impossible for me not to draw a parallel between the human brain and AI. I have to assume that if AI is fundamentally a surveillance technology because it learns about its environment and it makes predictions and that can be connected to some kind of decision-making factor, that the same applies to the human brain, which it kind of does. I mean, I have a human brain. That's sort of how it works. So I think that's all checks out. But this perspective also kind of unearths a fascinating hypothesis, which is what if our admiration for artificial intelligence ability to have the predictive prowess that it does should be reframed as an appreciation for it and our ability to surveil. Surveillance capabilities built in right there in the human brain, ears, eyes, memory, everything you would need. AI will be applied to every industry and it's going to work in the same way that our human brain surveils. Is that really what we want or should we maybe try to design it in a way that's different? Maybe we don't want artificial intelligence to do real prediction on us. Maybe it can analyze things and give us tips, but maybe it shouldn't be the surveilling prediction machine that it's going to naturally become if we don't get in its way. Maybe we should focus on making AI that doesn't have objective functions to predict things, even though it's massively profitable and I'm sure people will. What if we don't? It might be better. Because remember, it surveils at a scale that's incomprehensible. You can easily surveil everybody on Earth. It can do seven or eight billion people, no problem. Or it can be one person that can surveil and make predictions about more aspects of your life than hundreds of thousands of people all observing and predicting you at the same time. Okay, let me kind of break down get a little bit closer of a definition to what I mean by surveillance and how I see that through the lens of evolutionary history. So first off, one aspect of why humans are alive today, why you are an unbroken chain of humans that were able to reproduce is because of survival through environmental observation. That means all of our ancestors were either able to adapt to an environment or change that environment to suit their needs. In that sense, I'm considering surveillance the ability to see what's in your environment, anticipate opportunities and things that could cause danger and either avoid them or go get them. Another aspect would be integration via social surveillance. So the necessity to work together, say like you're hunting together, you're gathering together, you guys are collecting information on like which people in your tribe are trustworthy and which ones aren't. That's all social surveillance. That's all observation. And our ancestors who surveilled in that sense the best carried on their genes more often, and that built the brain more and more of our frontal cortex. Maybe we should call it the surveillance cortex. I don't know. That's just a thought. How about memory as a repository? Ever thought about surveillance in those terms? So in a sense, our brains actually archive like a vast swath of what we've surveilled. Surveillance, right? That's why you don't burn your hand on the stove twice. That's learning from the environment. Oh, fire is hot. This thing is sharp, yada, yada. Now the predictive capabilities after you've surveilled, you've analyzed, you've decided what the patterns are and you make a decision, that's all part of this too. So it's not just looking at the environment or looking at your social neighbors. Also, if you wanna go hunting for our ancestors, they had to make a prediction, like what kind of animal is that? What's it gonna do? And they have to think about that in terms of all the other times they've seen the animals, things other people have told them about the animals, and then they have to make an accurate prediction to eat. Now this part of artificial intelligence in today's world isn't quite here yet. This is one of the weaknesses of the large language model like ChatGPT is that it starts to forget after a while. But there are vector databases and they do seem like they're going to attach well to these large language models and some of these multimodal models. And there's all sorts of different ways we can have increase the context window. So I think memory in AI is around the corner. Now, if you lock in too much memory like a database, sometimes you can actually be kind of rigid. And that's why the human brain evolved neuroplasticity. Our brain's ability to adapt to new situations by actually reorganizing the way the brain's connected. The actual neurons can reorient their strength and through the electrical signals. That's this adaptive tool that is just like surveillance. In some movie, they're listening into somebody. What are they listening for? They're listening for information that's gonna make them understand what this person did that's illegal, where they're gonna be so they can capture them or whatever it is. They're, they're adapting to what they're saying and what they're going to do. And even though surveillance can be lots of things, it can be, you know, often it kind of seems like you're listening in on someone or you're watching a video. I would say that language itself is actually the biggest part of it. There's something crucial about language. It's ability to communicate what your intentions are, what you're thinking through language that really matter. Now, 
of course, there there are other aspects like through your body signals. You definitely know if somebody's like gonna draw a weapon or something like that. But it was the development of the voice and language that allowed us to surveil from the ancestral point of view in a way that we never could have before, and a way to communicate without actually having to go through some of those instances and seeing them. Especially if you want to warn somebody that something's dangerous, like it's way better to tell them than have them like go experience it and narrowly avoid the danger. So what would happen is some sort of a collective intelligence, like a group, a tribe, they might have learned a lot about their environment, what to eat, what to not eat. Whereas if somebody else came into that same environment, they just wouldn't have any of that information. But if any individual member happened to die, then the information sort of stayed in the group. And when new members came in, they could learn it rapidly. Now surveillance in the future might very well look like that too. Like imagine that all the Tesla self-driving cars that are actually looking at all these streets and intersections, that kind of data could correlate to some other data set. So that's showing you in real time where all the cars are, but maybe some other data set is talking about where all the phone calls are being made and there's correlations that can fit together. So while our brains clearly do an array of functions, and I would never say that they're only surveillance devices, I might argue that primarily that's not the worst lens to look at everything that it evolved to do under, if you had to put it in one camp. Individual surveillance was crucial for each of our ancestors and the evolution of our species as a whole. The underpinnings of our social intelligence, this desire we have to go build and adapt and grow and change the world, the environment that we're around, that comes from fundamentally a surveillance point of view. Or maybe I should phrase it more like a foundational surveillance mechanism. It's not what it does, but it's what its mechanics are. You know, and in some sense, what Meredith said, especially in the broader context, might be right. Right. And is this the future that we want for AI? Is this the kind of fundamental mechanism that we want to scale to billions and billions and billions of dollars of servers? And how can these like individual little human based localized surveillance systems actually help us prevent that future? Now I've hidden the subscriber button somewhere. So surveil this page to help me get to 8,000 subscribers. And shout out to my first Patreon, Doug. Thank you so much for the support. That means a lot to me.